Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. I'm going to make sure that our technology is working okay before we kick off and dive into our class. I am so excited about this. And I've been getting a lot of feedback that you guys are excited too. I love that we're diving into this topic. Yes, it looks like you guys are seeing me okay on Facebook. We've got people popping on over on Zoom. It is so nice to be with you guys. I am Dr. Laura Ritchie. I'm a doctor of physical therapy, a national board certified health and wellness coach, specializing in functional nutrition, women's health, and insulin resistance. And I'm an essential oil educator and global team leader with doTERRA International. Thank you guys for being here. If you're watching the replay, welcome to the replay. We have a giveaway, so stay tuned for all the details on how to win with that. We'll share about that at the end of the class. This is gonna be a really fun interactive workshop, so I really encourage you to take the time and space to really dive into this. Go grab something to drink, grab your water, grab a pen and paper to take notes, turn off those notifications, go to a quiet place, grab your essential oil, your favorite one, and we are going to talk about this subject. Now, this is not for little ears. So if you've got little ones, pop in your headphones, <laughs> right? Or catch the replay, because we're gonna be talking about some adult discussions on the body and female anatomy and all of those things. So don't say I didn't warn you. So <laughs> there's your little warning there as we jump in and talk a little bit more about this subject. I'm so glad to see you guys all hopping on. This is so exciting and so fun to connect with you all. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. We're gonna kick off and make sure that you guys can see the slides okay and jump in. So this is our getting a personal with your pelvic floor class. And as always, we just start with this little disclaimer that the information presented, it's not intended to replace a one-on-one -on -one relationship with your qualified healthcare professional. And it's not intended as medical advice. What I am doing is sharing my own education and knowledge from my own experience. And I really encourage you work in partnership with your qualified healthcare professional on this to dive deeper into some of these things that we're gonna talk about. For those that are brand new to me, this is my journey. This is what actually brought me into the world of functional nutrition, health coaching, essential oils, is I was actually diagnosed with an extremely rare sarcoma in 2011, a desmoid tumor that was in my abdominal wall. So you can see it there in the CT scan when it was surgically removed and they put synthetic mesh in my abdomen and the mesh actually herniated. And I had four additional surgeries related to the mesh and the herniation and getting all of that out. And you can see there that picture, the picture on the right hand side was when I actually had all of that synthetic mesh removed and they reconstructed my abdomen, my abdominal wall with my own muscle. It was a very big surgery, was in the hospital for five days, had drains coming out of me and also went on this interesting journey with adult hip dysplasia having some very major surgeries where they broke my pelvis in several places and repositioned it to give me a better coverage of the hip joint and then was diagnosed with chronic Lyme disease in 2015. So I've been on this journey to heal my body. I've learned a lot through this process. And that's what really encouraged me to come into this place of looking at things holistically. And it was actually, interestingly enough, my own personal journey with pelvic pain that brought me into pelvic floor physical therapy and talking about some of these things. So I know this can be kind of a taboo subject, uh, especially for women talking about what is the pelvic floor. Some of us don't even know what the pelvic floor is. We've never heard of that before. Some of us have, but this was the best picture that I could find, unfortunately. And it kind of, I think, demonstrates the challenges that we have with talking about the pelvic floor. But you can see here the sacrum bone in the back that is gonna be the tailbone. We've got the, the rectum here, we've got the uterus, we have a lot of things that you can see in a very small area of the body, including the uterus, the vagina, the bladder, everything is there and it is held together with the muscles and everything in our pelvic floor. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that, also about female anatomy. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for just a second. And we're going to kind of dive deeper into this so that you guys can see me. This is always a fun opportunity to bring out Bertha. Bertha is our pelvic floor model here. Any excuse to bring her out. She usually stays up there on my shelf, but she gets to be the star of the show today with this. So just talking about female anatomy, we'll talk about the organs as well. 
But female anatomy, the vulva is what we're going to call the external part of the female genitalia here. So that includes the mons pubis, the labia majora, labia minora, the clitoris, which is very important. There's actually 8,000 nerve endings on the clitoris. The clitoris was designed for pleasure. I find this fascinating. There is the vaginal opening, right? There's the urethra, the little hole that we pee out of vaginal opening here. And then we have this area between the vaginal opening and then the anus is called the peritoneum right here. So this is where when there's episiotomies or during labor and delivery, there can be a tearing between the vagina and the anus area. This can be a sensitive area for some people here. So female anatomy, that's kind of the basics that we have. And I would really encourage you get a hand mirror and take a look down here and see what your anatomy looks like. See if you can point out and name everything that we are talking about and just get an idea of reconnecting with your body. Because if you don't know what's normal for you, that's, that's really important and that will really empower you in a lot of ways. Now the pelvic floor is actually a network of the ligaments and the muscles and the connective tissues that acts as a hammock when we think about it from the tailbone, so our coccyx in the back here. So we've got the sacrum, we've got the coccyx, that tailbone, and it works kind of like a hammock, all of these muscles and ligaments and connective tissue, all the way to the front to our pubic bone. And we have our pubic symphysis right here. So this works to support the pelvic organs, to hold it up. This also includes the bladder, the rectum, the uterus and the vagina in women, but men have a pelvic floor too. We all have pelvic floor muscles. So there are different layers. To keep it super simple, there are superficial layers that you're gonna see here. There are deeper layers here. So when you go to see a pelvic floor PT and they do an internal examination, they actually go in vaginally or they can go in rectally and actually palpate and check these muscles of the pelvic floor. Now in men, because men can have pelvic floor issues as well, they do that rectally to check, but it's really important. They're muscles just like any other part of our body. And they are important because they are holding up our organs. So when we think about it, the, the vagina is actually a tube. It's a muscular tube here. We've got the uterus. We've got the ovaries on either side. So this is sitting here in the pelvic cavity as well as We've got um, the anus, we've got the rectum here, and then in the back, so we've got sacrum, the rectum, the bladder as well. Oh, there's a lot of stuff that is sitting in this little area. And it's interesting to me because we think of, we've got, right, maybe the GI doctor, if you're dealing with constipation or diarrhea or upset issues, we've got the ob right, with any type of issues with the uterus or the, the ovaries. We have the urologist who's dealing with the bladder. So a lot of stuff that's sitting in this very small space, and it's very, very important. So these muscles are keeping everything held up. They are working to support us. They help us with our bowel and bladder function, with our sexual function, with orgasm, and they work their sphincters. There's a lot of things that they can do. Now, even though we may not see these a lot, they are under voluntary control. So just like our arm muscles or our leg muscles, we can actually learn to contract and relax the muscles of the pelvic floor which is really, really powerful. So again, this gives us conscious control over the bladder, over the bowel. So when we release urine, when we have a bowel movement and poop, when we pass gas, all of this is allowing us to support ourselves, to empty when appropriately and hold up all of those organs, which is really, really important. So they do a lot. And I don't think that we talk about them enough. They're also assisting during pregnancy. So during the birthing process to hold everything up and these muscles can become weakened. They can become overstretched. They can become tightened and contracted. There's a lot of different things that can happen. So when we think about pregnancy or childbirth, for one reason, if you're straining on the toilet and we're going to talk more about that, if you are having maybe chronic coughing 
or chronic constipation that's going to put any increase in intra-abdominal pressure through the pelvic floor. Maybe you're doing a lot of high impact exercises, a lot of jumping or something like that. If you are um, overweight and you have a little bit more pressure over the muscles of the pelvic floor, just like with the joints, all of that can affect our body. And also looking at maybe we have overactive muscles, maybe we have something like a pelvic floor dysfunction where these muscles become tight, just like you can get a knot or a spasm maybe in your neck or in your shoulder. The same thing can happen with the muscles of the pelvic floor and they can become tightened. And so we're going to talk more about that, what we can do for that, how we can support that. We're going to talk about kegels and why I don't think everybody should just do kegels, but you need to do them appropriately. But the first thing that I think we need to talk about in this discussion is actually proper toileting techniques. So I did a post about this on social media and it really got a lot of buzz, which was actually one of the reasons why I decided to do this class. And I called it girls sit on the toilet. This is really, really important. When you are going to the bathroom, you need to make sure that you're relaxing and I want you to sit on the toilet seat. A lot of women are hovering. They're not allowing themselves to fully sit and relax. They're squatting or hovering over the toilet. And what we really need to do is relax the pelvic floor because as we kind of talked about and I showed you the urethra where we pee out of here, it's going through the pelvic floor muscles. And if the pelvic floor is contracted, it's going to make it hard to relax, to allow our bodies to release, to allow the bladder to empty urine, all of that. So we're going to talk about a couple things. If you're really nervous about sitting on the toilet seat, you can put down the paper lining. You could put down toilet paper. You could use your on guard hand sanitizer mist, which is one of my favorites. Spray that down, wash it down. But I guarantee you there are more germs on those handlebars, right, the doorknobs, things like that than there are in the toilet seat. This is going to be really, really, really important for your pelvic floor, especially if you're somebody who is struggling with urinary incontinence, leakage. Maybe you leak when you cough, sneeze, laugh, jump. Maybe you have urge incontinence where you hear water, or maybe you put the key in the door when you're coming home and you just feel this overwhelming sense that you have to go to the bathroom. All of this goes back to proper toileting techniques. So we want to do a couple things when we're going to the bathroom, and I'm gonna demonstrate this for you because I love you guys, right? So when you're going to the bathroom, you're gonna sit on the toilet. You are going to relax the muscles of your pelvic floor. You wanna reduce distractions. We don't wanna be on our phone. We don't wanna be thinking about other things. And most importantly, we do not wanna strain or push when going to the bathroom. So my favorite thing, if your home is to have a squatty potty, which looks like this, it's like a little stool that actually is designed to slide right up under your toilet seat. And what it does is it elevates your knees and your hips a little bit to get you in a better position to use the bathroom. So we're gonna see if you guys can see me. Okay, kind of like this. Okay, so I've got my feet up on the squatty potty. I don't know if you guys can see the squatty potty, but it's down there. So we, we've got our hips and our knees elevated a little bit. You can rest your elbows down like this. And what you want to do is actually kind of lean forward a little bit when going to the bathroom, taking some nice, slow, deep breaths, relaxing the pelvic floor, not pushing, not straining, just, just really trying to relax the pelvic floor. Now you can do this by visualizing those muscles feeling heavy, feeling warm, relaxing down. You can even visualize like a flower opening and relaxing that pelvic floor. Because again, these are voluntary muscles. We can contract those. It just takes a little bit of practice to contract, but also to relax. So the squatty potty puts you in a better position to let your pelvic floor relax and completely empty your bowels, your bladder. It actually improves this anorectal angle here when we are flexed up a little bit and allowing that pelvic floor to relax, but you can bend forward a little bit. If you're in a public restroom and you can't prop your legs up on a squatty potty, you just bend forward a little bit, rest your arms here, relax, go to the bathroom. If you're home, you can actually stack up some books or again, I love the squatty potty because it's really convenient. It's in my Amazon shop if you want to check it out and get one, but this will change your life. Okay, <laughs> so stop hovering over the toilet seat. Number one, relax when you're going to the bathroom. Use your squatty potty 
or prop your legs up on some books or something to put you in a better angle. And remember, do not strain, do not push, do not try to go to the bathroom as quickly as possible. We want to relax. It's really important to check in with your pelvic floor about once an hour. Bring some awareness to this area of your body. See if you can notice, is it contracted or is it relaxed? What does it feel like? What do those muscles feel like? And start to check in. What's interesting is nurses and teachers have the highest rate of incontinence because they're not able to go to the bathroom when they need to go to the bathroom. So when you're feeling that cue, like you need to go, that is the time to go ahead and go to the bathroom, okay? We don't wanna hold it. We wanna start listening to our body. We also don't wanna go to the bathroom just for the sake of going to the bathroom all the time. So when you're going to the bathroom, if you were to count, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. You should be able to void for eight Mississippis. If you didn't make it to eight Mississippis, you probably didn't have to go to the bathroom. So bringing awareness is the first step and really sit on the bathroom, ladies. Like sit on the toilet. It is really, really, really important for your pelvic floor. So I also want to encourage you to do some mirror work to learn a, contract, a correct contraction of your pelvic floor. So getting out a hand mirror, looking, observing your pelvic floor, observing the vulva, and identifying all of those areas. And when you do a Kegel, because we hear a lot about that sometimes when women go to the doctor and they say, hey, we're, I'm, I'm having some leakage, and they'll just say, go and do some Kegels. We want to make sure, one, that we're doing it correctly. Two, I don't think everybody needs to be doing Kegels. There's a time and place to do Kegel exercises. So if we have something like a pelvic floor dysfunction going on, what we were talking about, where those muscles can get spasmed or tight, when you try to strengthen a spasmed muscle, it can make the spasm worse. So in some cases, if women are struggling with urinary incontinence, leakage, and their doctor says go and do kegels, and they start to do that, and they're like, oh, that made everything worse. That made my leakage way worse. That's a sign to stop. And that's a sign to go get seen by a pelvic floor physical therapist or somebody who works internally with the muscles of the pelvic floor and check those to see if they're tight. Because just like if we have knots in our shoulder and our neck, they need to be released. The same thing can happen with the muscles of the pelvic floor as well. So it's very important to kind of check in because if you think about it, if those muscles are tight and then we're asking them to contract even more, it's kind of hard. Sometimes we have to work on relaxing and lengthening those muscles so we can do a full contraction. Now, there are cases when the pelvic floor muscles may be weakened and a Kegel is appropriate, but what happens when we've got that hand mirror and we're looking at this area of the body and you do a Kegel is you're pulling up and in. So it should actually pull the pelvic floor muscles up and in and should close off the vaginal and anal openings. You should actually see them close a little bit when doing a Kegel. Now, bulging down is when you press down like you're having a bowel movement or gonna pass gas and that will cause these openings to open more. So what's interesting is a lot of women actually think they're doing a Kegel, but they're actually bulging down. They're bearing down, they're pressing down and opening instead of that drawing up and in up and in with the pelvic floor. So a Kegel is kind of like if you were going to stop the flow of urine, I don't recommend that you do that. You could do that maybe like once a month to just kind of check in and see how your pelvic floor is doing, but that shouldn't be something that we're doing regularly where we're urinating and then stopping and urinating. So we don't want to do that, right? We want to relax and let the, let the bladder empty when we're doing that. But see what happens to these areas. If you're not sure if you're doing it correctly, you can get a little Q-tip or a tampon and kind of slightly insert it right in the vaginal area here and then do that Kegel and you should see it pull up and in, pull up and in. If you're bulging, bearing down, that's pushing out. So this is very, very important because a lot of what we do in physical therapy is re-education. Now I'm giving you some tools and some education around this, but it doesn't replace an evaluation and treatment by a qualified pelvic floor physical therapist. So these are things to look at. And if you need more of that one-on-one, -on -one, I would recommend go get an evaluation done by somebody. So that's first, we wanna make sure that we're doing the contractions correctly. Now, there is a practice called the knack, and the knack is when we do a Kegel, when we tighten that transverse abdominis muscle, 
So that is how you can cue in the TA, the transverse abdominal muscle, transverse abdominus muscle, is you're gonna pull in a little bit like you're gonna zip up a tight pair of jeans. So if you were to palpate on your abdomen, when you find your hip bones on either side here, you can kind of put your fingers on your hip bones. If you go in just a little bit and down just a little bit, and then you pull in just a hair, like you were gonna zip up a tight pair of jeans. It's very slight. You're gonna feel this muscle pop up and press up into your finger. That's your transverse abdominus muscle. Okay, so when doing a knack, the knack is what we call it, is when we do that kegel, we do that pull up and in with the pelvic floor, and we tighten up that transverse abdominus muscle just a little bit, like we're gonna zip up a tight pair of jeans. And that is going to basically work as a, a bracing, if you will. So if you know that you're gonna cough or sneeze or laugh, and you know that you have leakage with those things, you can do this preventatively and you can practice this. So you can tighten up a little bit, tighten that transverse abdominus muscle, and then <coughs> like turn to the side and cough or practice sneezing. So these are things that you can do that can help before a cough, before a sneeze, to help to prevent leakage in those areas as you strengthen that. Now again, there's pelvic floor strengthening and we do kegels with that. And we start this exercise usually lying down or on your side so that we're minimizing gravity. If you start to do kegels and you're doing them sitting or standing, your pelvic floor is having to fight against a lot of gravity. So if you can lay on your back, it's kind of gravity assisted. Or if you lay on your side, that's gonna help you a little bit with working on the kegels. So you can practice long holds. So maybe once you've done the mirror work, once you know that you're getting the right contraction, you can contract and hold for 10 seconds and then relax and contract and hold for 10 seconds. These are the long holds and relax. And we also do quick flicks. So there's slow twitch and fast twitch muscle fibers in our muscles. The slow twitch muscle fibers, I think of those more, they're like the marathon runners, the endurance ones. That's why we practice the long holds because maybe you have to go to the bathroom and you can't get to a bathroom just right away. So you're going to do that long hold to help you make it to the bathroom. The quick flicks, that's going to be like where you contract for like one, 1,000, two, 1,000 and relax. Contract one, 1,000, two, 1,000 and relax. That's gonna be like coughing, sneezing, laughing, any increase in intra-abdominal pressure that we need to contract really quickly to help us with that. So I would recommend doing both and maybe you start with like three sets of 10 of the long holds, holding for 10 seconds and relaxing. And then you could also add in the quick flicks like contract, relax, contract, relax. Again, you wanna do the mirror work first to make sure that you're doing this well, you also want to make sure just as important as the contraction is, the relaxation part is just as important. So when we start to tune in, and that's why I say check in with your pelvic floor once an hour, you can start to notice, is it tight? Is it contracted? Let's see if I can relax that a little bit and get those muscles to sink down and feel warm and kind of sink into your pants is cues that we do for relaxing the pelvic floor. Now, if you start these exercises, stop if you notice any adverse symptoms, maybe you have increased low back pain or increased urinary leakage with sneezing or you're just noticing issues, maybe it's making the incontinence worse, stop, stop. That probably means we're strengthening a spasm muscle and it's time to get an internal evaluation by a pelvic floor PT. So tune in, listen to your body. Again, this is just education that we're providing here, but very important with the pelvic floor. So. Yes, you can do kegels. Yes, there is a time and place for it, but there's also a time and place not to do them. So tune in with your body, listen to how you're doing with that. Now, sitting recommendations. Ideally, when we're sitting, we don't wanna cross your legs. You wanna make sure that your feet are fully supported by the ground, that you're relaxing your legs as much as you can. And you'd be surprised how many people like tighten up their adductors, right? They like bring their, bring their legs in and tighten, 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 or they're walking around with their glutes tightened all the time. We wanna make sure that there are times again when the pelvic floor can relax, when we're relaxing our legs that we're supported in the chair there and noticing how we're feeling. Because if we're just sitting here, we should be able to relax pelvic floor. In movement, walking things, the pelvic floor is gonna kick in to support us and hold all of our organs up against gravity, right? But just sitting or even just in a standing position 
we should be able to let those muscles relax so they're not on contracting all the time with that. So bladder irritants. This is another one. For some, not for everybody, but if you're somebody that struggles with leakage, look into bladder irritants. You know, maybe you're having urinary leakage or you're just feeling like you're not able to fully empty your bladder or you're struggling with these different things. Coffee, alcohol, citrus, chocolate, and carbonated beverages, like the Cokes and the sodas, those can be bladder irritants. So we wanna work on slowly eliminating those, like maybe you're somebody who's drinking Diet Cokes, they're really not good for our bladder or for our pelvic floor and for our health in general, right? So we can start to gradually work on decreasing those. If you have to have your coffee, make sure that you're drinking water with that, okay? Because that can make the urine really acidic and it can start to irritate the lining of the bladder. So having water with those things. Um, also, because this is, this is an issue that comes up quite a bit with women, if they're dealing with urinary incontinence or leakage, they may stop drinking water, right? Because they're like, oh, well, I'm gonna leak anyways, so I don't wanna do all of that. But in reality, you wanna be making sure that you're staying hydrated and drinking a lot of water. And people will look at me crazy when I tell them this, like, are you serious? I don't wanna be drinking any more water right now. But it is really important because if you're dehydrated, that urine is gonna get very acidic and it's gonna irritate the lining of the bladder and it could cause it to go into spasm more the bladder there and get irritated and then can contribute to some of the leakage. So for some people, and I can tell you, I've had patients in the clinic that just ditching the, the sodas, right? Huge improvement in all of this alcohol. Again, for some people, citrus or chocolate and those carbonated beverages. Some of my pelvic floor patients, I had one in particular, she was like, I'm not giving up the soda. And I said, okay, that's definitely your choice. But she knew if she was going to have a soda, she would leak. We got her to a place in pelvic floor PT where she had zero leakage unless she had a soda. So something to look at. It's interesting how the foods and the things that we consume can contribute to that a little bit, but that's an important piece to kind of look at. Nutrition in the pelvic floor is also really important because we know that food sensitivities can cause inflammation and it can cause the immune system, which surrounds the digestive system to overreact. So if there's chronic inflammation that's going on, that can show up as pain anywhere in the body. That can include the pelvis. That can include the hips, things like that. So often my clients with pelvic floor pain or issues, they don't just come in just with pelvic pain. They also will have IBS, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, in addition to pelvic pain or pelvic floor issues. So if you're not having normal bowel movements and you're struggling with chronic constipation, this is going to affect the muscles of your pelvic floor here. And chronic constipation, it can actually really irritate the, the pelvic floor muscles, the fascial support, the ligaments. It can cause stretching of the pedendal nerve, which runs through here due to prolonged straining. This is why it's really important that you don't strain or push when going to the bathroom that can lead to pelvic floor weakness, that could lead to nerve irritation. So constipation also puts more pressure on the bladder and on the urethra, which may cause increased urinary frequency or retention. So it's really important that we address these things. We look at the chronic constipation, we look at any pelvic floor dysfunction or tightness that's going on with this. It's all related. We have to look at the body holistically. So reducing inflammation through diet, through improving bowel movements, by eliminating food sensitivities, increasing water intake, making sure that you're really hydrated, it's gonna have a profound effect on your body, on your pelvic floor, on your bladder, on your colon, on all of that. And it's very, very important. So hydration, nutrition, stress reduction, appropriate exercise, sleep issues, it's all holistic here. So let's talk a little bit about constipation, about what's going on there. How do we know if we're dealing with it? Because a lot of people actually don't think they're constipated when they actually are. So this is the, the Bristol stool scale. This is kind of the gold standard that we use to see what's happening. Because if you're not having two to three well-formed bowel movements per day, you're constipated. 
we should be like babies and pets where food comes in and it goes out, right? And if you're thinking about it, if we're taking a lot of food in and nothing's coming out, we're basically becoming toxic. That stuff has to need to come out somewhere. So urination, like when we pee, when we poop, these are ways that the body detoxifies and removes that waste from our system. And it's really important. So Bristol stools chart here. See what your poop looks like. And if you're not looking at your poop, start there. Look at your poop. This is, this is really important to be able to address that and look at those things, right? So see where you are on the scale, okay? A type 1 or a type 2 is going to be more constipation. That's constipation. Our goal is going to be a type 3 or 4. That is going to be really important. Now, a type 5, 6, or 7 is loose stool. So it's leading more towards diarrhea in this than constipation. So just notice where you are on this chart. But if you're one or a two, you're constipated. So we need to start looking at some of these things because it's all, all related. Now, if we're dealing with a chronic constipation, we need to start looking at, again, staying hydrated, drinking enough water. My favorite is doing a little bit of lemon essential oil, doTERRA's lemon essential oil and water because that helps with detoxification. It helps with supporting your digestive system and priming that and getting that moving, maybe doing a little bit of warm water with a little bit of lemon essential oil in the morning. Now, the lemon essential oil is from the rind not the fruit. So it doesn't have the citric acid. So if you're one of those people that citrus really does cause a bladder irritation for you, we see that a lot with like interstitial cystitis or different things. You, for most people, they're going to be able to tolerate the citrus essential oils because again, it's not coming from the fruit. It's coming from the rind. It's very high in limonene. You're getting a different chemical constituent with that different supportive properties with that. But I love making sure that you're drinking enough water, and I love doing a citrus oil with that because of the protective properties with limonene, avoiding processed foods that you're sensitive to, and eating enough fruits and vegetables, and eliminating gluten, dairy, and sugar. Those are big, big, highly inflammatory foods that can contribute to constipation. Some of these things, the top seven food sensitivities, gluten, dairy, sugar, soy, corn, peanuts, and eggs. So look at that. And I did a class, you can find it on YouTube called Nourishing from Within, if you want to dive deep into the nutritional pieces with that. You want to take a high quality probiotic. So something like PB Assist Plus, it's going to help to repopulate your gut with the good gut bacteria. That's really going to help you have a healthy gut, healthy bowel movements. And I personally take the PB Assist on an empty stomach before I go to bed. So it's not competing with food for absorption. Some people can't do that. So you can take it with a meal, maybe with breakfast in the morning if it works best for you. So see what works best for you in that situation there. Now, I also recommend taking a digestive enzyme like Terrazyme. This helps to break down the proteins, the fats, the carbohydrates, and be able to absorb the nutrients in your meal. And this is important because people say you are what you eat, but you actually are what you absorb. So by taking two to three terrazine with every meal, that's going to really help you to break down those foods and help with better gut health. Now, side note, you can actually take one to two terrazine on an empty stomach to help with aches or discomfort. So think sore muscles or athletes or just helping with a healthy inflammatory response in the body. There's some really interesting research. If you look that up, sports injuries and digestive enzymes, adding in enzymes there. So just a little side note that you can kind of check into that and see. I also love Digestin essential oil. This is our digestive blend, digestive support there. So you can add a little bit topically, dilute it because there's some spicy oils in here with a little bit of carrier oil, but you can just apply it over the abdomen as needed several times throughout the day or make a roller bottle with maybe 10 to 15 drops in a 10 ml roller and fill the rest with carrier oil and use that. You can do a drop or two internally. You can add it to water and drink that. And it does have a black licorice taste. If you don't love the black licorice taste, there are soft gels, digest and soft gels that you can do instead or put it in a veggie capsule. But this can be a game changer with helping to support your digestive system. I love to, to put digest and topically over my abdomen at night before I go to sleep to really help support, you know, help with um, healthy inflammatory response, GI support, leaky gut support, all of those things. So try that for a week. Just try putting some digestion over your tummy before you go to bed. And then you may notice when you wake up, 
you have less bloat, but this is, think of this for gas, bloat, indigestion, occasional upset tummy, anything like that, this is gonna be huge. And then magnesium. This is really important because most people are deficient in magnesium. I love Natural Calm, but there's a bunch of different magnesium brands out there. So you can slowly increase the amount until you get loose stool. So I follow the directions on the Natural Calm, slowly increase that amount there. And then once you start to get loose stool, back off a little bit, and then that's when you find that you're at that great spot, the sweet spot for your body of the magnesium. You can also do Epsom salt baths. This would allow for topical absorption of the magnesium. It can help you relax before bed if you struggle with getting good sleep. And then I love to do a couple drops of lavender, serenity or balance essential oil and add it to the Epsom salt before I put it in the bath to soak. So I will usually do about two cups of Epsom salt, 10 drops of an essential oil added to the salt, and then you add that to the water, and then about a cup of baking soda with that. There's also magnesium sprays and gels, so you can play with that a little bit and see to kind of have that on, um, how that feels for you and, and what works best. Now, let's talk about essential oils for support with all of these things. So we have a bladder support roller, and this can be something that is really helpful. Actually, juniper berry and cypress applied over the bladder is a great thing that you could do. So if you're somebody that struggles, maybe you're waking up in the middle of the night and multiple times and you have to go to the bathroom, or you're just feeling like that strong urge all the time, you can apply this blend. So again, 15 drops of each, top with your fractionated coconut oil, put that in a 10 ml roller bottle, and then just apply it right over the bladder. So super pubic area there, do it before bed, do it as you need to for urge or leakage. This is also a great blend for kids. If you have children that are wetting the bed at night, I would just dilute more for kids. So maybe start with five drops of each in a roller, and then you could always gradually increase if you needed. Less is more with the essential oils, and if you needed stronger, you can always open it up and add a little bit more oil. But this has been a game changer for so many women in our oils family. If they're waking up in the middle of the night or if they're just having that strong urge, this is a really great blend to try. So you can screenshot that, try that out, and have that on hand there. For pelvic aches and discomfort, there is, this is a great blend. So this was actually a blend that my, my pelvic floor physical therapist taught me about. And it's geranium and lavender. You can do 10 drops of lavender, 8 drops of geranium. Add that to a two ounce spray bottle. This is a spray bottle. I took this picture from shareoils.com. She has beautiful glass spray bottles. You can find them at a lot of places. I love Elka over at Share Oils. She's a dear friend of mine. And then you just top the rest with fractionated coconut oil. So you now have a heavily diluted spray. And you can apply this, spray this topically as needed to the vulva, to those areas. So maybe you're having burning pain or any type of discomfort, you can apply that topically and spray that to help to cool, to help to calm that down as needed. Again, heavily diluted, using a carrier oil with that. And Elka is so sweet, she gave us a coupon code. You can use Dr. Laura 10 for 10% off anything in her shop. So you could grab your spray bottle and use some of those things. But this is a really great one to help to calm if you're dealing with pelvic discomfort or anything here. So there's some interesting research that my pelvic floor PT shared with me about this blend, about how lavender essential oil can really help with peritoneal trauma. Again, there's a lot of things that fall into that category, but if we're thinking about trauma with childbirth, again, any tearing, episiotomies, anything like that, um, this is great. Actually, if you are in a situation where you are pregnant, there's some interesting blends. I mean, again, you could use geranium and lavender, heavily dilute. You can even add in a little bit of heliochrysum or frankincense and do like a peritoneal massage and start doing that before delivery to work on stretching those tissues so that they don't tear. Um, even having somebody during labor and delivery who's actually doing a peritoneal massage and working on those muscles of the pelvic floor, that can be a really powerful thing. And then this was some interesting research about the protective activity of geranium oil and its component in vaginal washing agents and actually um, candidiasis. So when we're looking at different things to kind of help support the body, these were two oils that my pelvic floor PT found some research in. And when she was trying it out with her pelvic 
pain patients had some really good success. So try it. You know, you can always dilute it more if you need to with this, but it's a really great blend that we've seen great success as well with. For pelvic flares, maybe you're having pelvic pain, burning pain. I dealt with vestibulodynia for a long time and I'm actually doing so much better. But when you would have a, a flare like that, oftentimes they will tell you to go sit on frozen peas. So what you can do is actually add a drop or two of peppermint essential oil into the toilet water. Okay, we don't wanna do that straight on topically. That's a very cooling oil and, and for sensitive skin and we don't wanna do that. But you can add a drop or two of peppermint oil into the toilet water and then sit on the toilet and that helps to cool and relax the pelvic floor. So this is a really nice one if you are in a flare and you need support, maybe you just had a baby and everything is, is sore and healing, so you can just sit on the toilet and have that there. Maybe you're working on potty training with a little one. This is another good one that you can do, just a drop of the peppermint oil in the toilet and have them sit on the toilet and it can help them, but a good way to help relax the pelvic floor. Little tip for you there. So some other tips that we need to talk about too when looking at pelvic floor and all of these things is Clary Calm. And this is one of my favorite essential oils for hormones. So you can roll a little Clary Calm in the palm of your hand and you can just inhale it. When hormone symptoms strike, you can put it on like perfume and have that on hand there. It's a blend. So there's a lot of really great things in Clary Calm. It, it helps with healthy estrogen and progesterone balance in the body. It can help if you're having painful cycles, it can help with a healthy inflammatory response in the body. But this is something you're going to see the best effects when you're using it daily for overall hormonal balance, even when you don't have cramps anymore. So there's estrogen support in here, like ylang-ylang and clary sage that help to support adequate amounts of estrogen. If you're having postmenopausal issues during this time, this could be a really nice one to kind of help support with um, the brain, the heart, the breast, all, all of this to really help us if, if we're dealing with um, maybe a low estrogen or feeling sad. And this is the beautiful thing about the essential oils is they bring balance. They bring homeostasis into the body. They're not going to like force a chemical reaction in the body, like say a prescription. They're going to come in and bring balance. So when people are saying, um, okay, my estrogen's too low. This could be something to kind of bring in homeostasis or my estrogen's too high. Again, bringing in homeostasis in the body, which is really nice to support our endocrine system. So you can see here, lots of things here. Uh, Vitex oil, the chase berry, which actually helps to balance progesterone. And you can see it kind of helps with um, bioidentical kind of phytoestrogens. It's antispasmatic. So again, if we're having menstrual cramps or issues there, that could be a nice one. But this is a good one to, again, support our hormones, the, the geranium, the lavender, the Roman chamomile, all of these oils that can help to relax. These can even help us with a little bit of adrenal support. Cedar wood in here, because some women can kind of live in the state of feeling wired all the time and go, go, go. So this is going to just kind of help us to bring some calm in. A lot of these oils are very beautiful for stress and grounding with us. So a really, really beautiful blend. Again, I recommend that you do this regularly. Don't just wait till you're on your period. So you can do a little swipe, um, you know, just swipe along the lower abdomen or along the panty line. You can swipe along the inside of the wrist and also the inside of the ankle bones, those medial malleoli. Just swipe along the inside of your ankles and that would be a great one to do too. Again, you're going to see the best results with this when using it daily. Yes, women use it for menstrual cramps and discomfort and you can definitely use it then, but use it every day. You're going to see a big difference with hormone support when you do that. So pulse points around the ankles, lower abdomen, as we mentioned, during your menstrual cramps, use it daily. Even if you're having those hormonal head tension moments, right, when we're just feeling it, you can actually grab your Clary Calm and apply it over forehead and temples and the back of the neck. That would be a really great thing to do. I love the emotional piece of the oils and the benefit that they do for us. So Clary Calm actually encourages this warmth in relationships, this emotional intimacy, it's a really beautiful oil for helping with those maternal instincts, very nurturing. This is the monthly blend for women. It helps with easing fear of rejection, 
what I think is so interesting about this is it releases emotional tension within the reproductive organs and helps to release the expectations of suffering and dread related to monthly cycle. So this is helping with emotional intimacy and vulnerability, but how many women are taught that they're going to have their periods and it's going to be bad and it's going to hurt and sturdy and you know, it's bloody. And uh, I think there's so much reframing that we need to do around the female body, around our female anatomy, even talking about some of those things. And this is all information from the emotions and essential oil book. That is a fabulous book. I highly recommend that you, you snag that book because it's just a wealth of information when we can look and see what the oils do on a physical level, but also on an emotional level with this, it's really powerful. So again, if you're feeling tension, if you're feeling very guarded or you're just dreading suffering during menstruation or menopause, this is a nice one to help us feel more vulnerable more receptive, more empathetic, even to our body. Very, very powerful. Again, reframing those views around our femininity. Jasmine is a really beautiful oil to help us in this area. So this helps to balance our healthy sexuality, healthy forces. It really helps us to have a good sexual experience. So removing those unhealthy sexual intentions and motivations, if there were sexual traumas maybe that have happened, this is something that can help us with healing and encouraging safety and intimate relationships and pure intentions with the sexual experience. So I would highly encourage you if you are somebody who has experienced sexual trauma and that's something that you're working on, this is a really beautiful oil to bring in for self-acceptance, for trust. What I think is so interesting is a lot of these floral oils they're very feminine, right? And it's getting back into our divine feminine and our healing, but they also look like vulvas. The flowers, as they open, if you look at a picture of a flower and you look at the vulva, they look very similar. And it's interesting to me that they can help with our hormones, with our libido and our sex drive, but also on an emotional level, helping to heal some of these things. So that's a really beautiful oil. I have to tell you a story with Jasmine. When I first got Jasmine, I hated the smell of this oil. It just was a lot. And some of you guys that are following me now on Instagram and, and social media have, have seen that I've been on this journey to heal my body with ovarian cysts, and that's been coming up. And there is this history um, of sexual trauma, not to me, but to someone very close to me. And I almost feel like that that was passed on. And plus having this long history of pelvic pain. And so many of my clients could not look at themselves with a mirror. They didn't want to touch themselves. They didn't want to, th there was, there's this feeling that the female anatomy is very dirty or shameful. And I look at us as a society of how much we just look at all of the products on the market to like freshen up or cleanse or any of that. And by the way, don't use any of those. Your vulva and your vagina, it's like a self cleaning oven, right? Just water. We don't need to put any strong things in that area, right? Just water to wash that area and be very gentle with it. But there's this stigma that it's, that it's dirty or again, you know, in our period that oh, it's bleeding and it's heavy and all these things. And when I did the deep emotional work around this, it's, it's the wounded feminine and it's stepping into owning and loving ourselves and our female anatomy. Because when we think about it, the, the female body is pretty amazing. It can create life right? It can literally birth life. That is a big deal. You are amazing in that. And when I was having really painful periods and the ovarian cysts, I actually said out loud to my husband, it'd be easier if I was a guy. And he said, well, I don't want you to be a guy. <laughs> but these thoughts of, hmm, maybe it would be easier there. And what is really powerful is stepping into our female womanhood, right? Looking at that and, and healing that. And Dr. Christian Northrup talks about this. I did a whole post about this, if you want to go deeper into this. But when I started sharing about this, publicly talking about this, what was so interesting is Jasmine smelled completely different to me afterwards. It was like, I finally could smell the sweeter tones of this oil 
before it just smelled like, oh, it was, it was too much for me. So again, if you're smelling an essential oil and you do not like the smell of it, maybe something like geranium, that's, that's a big one for love and trust, or any of these floral oils as we're exploring the pelvic floor, there's a smell and it's just like too much for you. Look up in the Emotions and Essential Oils book what the emotional component of that is. And as you dive deeper and as you work on this, because again, it's mind, body, soul, spirit, the emotional health reflects the physical health. So if you are living in shame, if you're not feeling like you can fully embrace that part of your body or feel like it's dirty or, or even disconnected from yourself, I really encourage you to go to more of the floral oils. But Jasmine in particular was a big one for me and the smell completely changed. So if you don't like the smell of an oil, heavily dilute it. It's bringing out an emotional component, maybe a drop or two in a 10 ml roller, roll it on the bottoms of your feet, put socks and shoes on so you don't even have to smell it and then smell it again in a week and just see and notice if it smells different for you. That's a really powerful experiment that you can do. But as again, as we dive deeper into this, I just thought that that was really fascinating for all of these things. Whisper. This is another one of my favorite, favorite blends. So this is the blend for women. And again, right, if we want to soften that over masculine energy and masculine is like, go, 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 do, do, do. You know, if we're always in that masculine, we can burn out really quickly. So this helps us to get more in touch with that feminine and letting go and relaxing into some of these things and even healing relationships with our mother or our grandmothers or women and reconnecting that. Again, if there's been separation or abuse or something that's happened, any um, traumatic experiences, this helps us to relate to the feminine and sexuality with that. So this is actually a really beautiful blend for accepting our femininity, for being gentle and kind to ourselves. It is actually designed as a perfume. What's really interesting about Whisper is it smells different on everybody because it interacts with your own body's chemistry. So it creates a unique signature scent that is all your own. But this may be a really, really beautiful one to add into your regimen and have on hand and start to use. It's a beautiful, beautiful oil to help support you in these areas. So look at, look at the emotions on that. And again, as always, like when I'm talking about essential oils, especially putting it on such a precious oil area of the body, like the vulva, make sure quality matters. I trust and love doTERRA. You can go to their source to you website and actually see the quality reports and the testing for your batch of oil. Not all essential oils are created equally. Essential oils have their own chemical makeup. They react to the body in different ways and everything from the harvesting to the production, to the testing, to the distributors, that all plays a role into how pure the essential oils are. You wanna make sure that they're tested, that there's not fillers, preservatives, impurities, because 95% of the oils on the market are adulterated. So I am not talking about doing this with lavender from the health food store, right? Or lavender from Walmart or whatever. It's very different. I wouldn't even consider those essential oils. I consider those a synthetic fragrance. So quality really matters. doTERRA does 54 tests on each sample to make sure that they are pure. 43 of those are done in house and 11 are done through a third party testing lab called Aromatic Plant Research Center, APRC. So quality matters. Again, this is an oil that I picked up at a department store and it says that it's 100% pure, right? And you can tell a fake oil really quickly this way. But when you flip it over, you know, is it safe? Is it safe for internal use? Is it safe for topical use? Like this actually says that it causes skin irritation, eye damage, allergic reactions, fatal if swallowed, toxic to aquatic life. This is not a therapeutic grade oil. This is not something that I would put on my skin or do at all. But look, that label says 100% pure. So again, there's no governing agency that's regulating this, which means that these companies can put whatever they want on that bottle of oil. So I think it's really, really important to do your research. doTERRA is the brand that I know, love, and trust with this. So be a label reading gangster and make sure that you're doing what feels best because we know synthetic fragrances, they're harmful to our hormones. We don't even want to be breathing them in, let alone applying that to our skin and or taking something topically. You know, a pure therapeutic grade lavender should be something that should be safe to take internally. So all good things to consider. Again, quality really matters with this. Do your own research. 
respect the oils, dilute them, work with a qualified healthcare professional and your essential oil educator with this. If you don't have peace about something, don't do it. But always, always, always listen to your body. Notice how you feel with these things going on. And now we're going to get a little controversial, but I want you to stay with me here with this because I've been doing deep work in the inner feminine. And there is this book by Regina. She's also known as Mama Gina. And it is called Pussy, a Reclamation. Now, I know that is considered a very taboo word, a word that's got a lot of emotion around it or shame or whatever you want to call that. But she talks about in the book why she titled it that way and why she uses that word to almost embrace the feminine and the goddess. And there's actually a lot of reverence and love in that. But reconnecting with you. So she actually talks about tuning in once an hour, which is interesting because in the pelvic floor world, we talk about that, right? See if you're contracted or relaxed. What does the pelvic floor feel like? But bringing awareness to this area of our body. She even says, try going panty-free one day a week, like an example of a panty-free Friday. If any of this that I'm saying is making you uncomfortable, it's probably something that you need to address. And I can tell you, I'm reading this book right now, and it is literally changing my life of how I look at my body, look at my femininity, all of these things. And just like I talked about getting a mirror and looking at your female anatomy, she talks about doing that as well and saying hello to your body and to yourself and saying hello, gorgeous, or good morning, beautiful, or sleep well, sexy. We should talk to our female body this way. We should start to embrace this. And she gives this exercise in the book of try these things for three weeks and notice how you feel. Because again, this is our connecting with our female life force, connecting with that energy. This is a really powerful thing. And again, in today's society, I think there's so much shame around this and it's tuning back in. Again, the clitoris has 8,000 nerve endings. It was designed for pleasure. So bringing in more joy and life and fun and pleasure, having an orgasm can help with pain. It can help with hormonal balance. It can help with a lot of different things. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do that with a partner. It's exploring your body and your anatomy. So I would really encourage you, if you are open, if you're ready to do the deep healing work around this and step into your femininity, um, even your confidence around this area, this would be a book that I would add to your list for sure. Okay, finding a pelvic floor PT. There are two really great websites that you can look. So one is Herman and Wallace. It's pelvicrehab.com. You guys can screenshot these. The other is the section on women's health from the American Physical Therapy Association. They have a PT locator. And it's over there, womenshealthapta.org. Um, you can find them, both of those there. So looking for a pelvic floor PT. If you are struggling in these areas, if you're having any type of aches or discomfort, you know, typically red flags, if we're having urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, leakage, low back pain, hip pain, SI pain, pain that doesn't improve with traditional orthopedic physical therapy, pain with tampons, pain with pelvic exams, pain with intercourse, organ prolapse, you're just feeling like something is falling out or a pressure. All of these things are not normal and need to be addressed by a pelvic floor PT. So talk to your OB-GYN, talk to your doctor. In some states, you'll need a prescription to go and see the pelvic floor PT. In other states, you don't. You can just go right there and, and see them. But I would encourage you to get an examination and take a look at all of that and heal yourself. There's so many commercials for like poise pads, right? That, that, that's like, oh, leakage is normal. We just, we just put, a, put a pad on. There's a lot that you can do to help with this. It is very, very powerful. Oh, so Ileana said, thanks so much, um, Ileana, for sharing this. Yeah, there's a pelvic floor PT finder, pelvicguru.com. For me, healing the pelvic pain, and I had horrible, horrible pelvic pain. Um, any, it was provoked. So even if you put like a touched a, a Q-tip to that area, I would be in extreme pain. I couldn't wear tampons or do pelvic exams or any of those things. And it's been a long road, but with working with the pelvic floor PT, working with essential oils, doing the emotional health, all of these things, um, it's been huge. It's been life changing. So I really encourage you get some help, get some support and see a pelvic floor PT. This is a rare specialty. A lot of these women are going to have wait lists about three to six months. So you're going to want to get on those wait lists and go and see them, but it can change your life. Different training than from a traditional physical therapist. So this would be a great one to check out. 
And these are some books to check out. Women's Bodies, Women's Wisdom by Dr. Christian Northrup. Fabulous, fabulous book. If you want to dive deeper into period pain and really healing your body, I love Period Repair Manual by Laura Bryden. Fantastic book. Again, Pussy, A Reclamation by Regina. It, it's amazing. These books are really great. So look into them. Be open-minded, especially with healing and, and going deeper in that to that divine feminine. Very powerful stuff. If you're brand new to the world of essential oils, if you don't have an account with doTERRA yet, I would love to be your oil mentor and guide. I actually put together this kit for women's health with a lot of the things that we've talked about, the juniper berry and cypress for bladder support, the clary calm for hormone support, the lavender and geranium for hormone support, as well as pelvic discomfort. But we can also piece together your own kit. So if you've got questions, if you have specific things, reach out to me and I can help you with that. It would be my joy and honor to be a guide and support you along your journey. And this comes with a beautiful book from doTERRA, but also education support. We have a private Facebook group that we'll plug you into so you can ask questions and get help. I'll mail you a really fun welcome packet with some tools and resources in the mail, as well as do a one-on-one -on -one welcome call with me so we can dive deeper and teach you exactly how to use these oils. So that is an option that's going to be our flash sale this month to have on hand if you're looking to dive deeper into this. Here's a bunch of resources, my website, my email, I'm on Facebook. If you're finding value from the information that I share here, please go and like my Facebook page. I would be so, so appreciative. This is the Facebook group, the Learning with Dr. Laura Facebook group that I teach a class in once a month. We have a podcast. I'm on Instagram and all the social media and also on YouTube, over 420 videos on health and wellness and education with the essential oils over on YouTube as well that you can subscribe to. And if you already have an account with doTERRA, I want to remind you because this ends tomorrow, August 10th, that you can actually purchase a ticket to doTERRA's convention. This is gonna be incredible. The price goes up after tomorrow to $60. So this is the early bird session. If you found value from what I'm sharing and educating, if you wouldn't mind putting me as a referral, I would be so grateful. But you can go to livestream.doTERRA.com and purchase your ticket to see. And you have until, I think, through the month of October. So a month and a half to watch all of the replays and they go through the science and the education on the essential oils, the new oils that released, all of these things, it's so powerful. So I wanted to give you guys a quick reminder, screenshot that and don't forget to go and snag your ticket. And I wanted to hang out for just a little bit if you guys have any questions or concerns or if I can help and serve in any way. We have our giveaway. To enter the giveaway, I have put together, actually it's a really beautiful, it's a happy, roller. It actually has whisper in it, which is one of the essential oils that we talked about, as well as other oils that are really great for hormonal support, lots of citruses. So this is actually a blend of balance, whisper, citrus bliss, elevation. And then I added in our new citrus bloom oil. Smells incredible. So this is going to be our giveaway. Somebody's going to get that to enter. Make sure that you just post a learning comment below, something that you learned, something that you found helpful, and you'll be entered into the giveaway to snag this. We'll leave it open through Friday, August 16th to give people watching the replay a chance to enter this as well. If you're watching on Zoom, go over to Facebook into the group and you can enter and be added in there. Yes, Ileana shared Healing Pelvic Pain by Amy Stein. Is, it is a great book. Yes, for breathing and stretching. She's got some really great tools and, and things in there too. All right, any questions, concerns? We went a little long, but there's so much information that I wanted to share with you guys on this topic. I love that we are having this conversation and diving deeper. I'll be back next month with another health and wellness class to support you. I'm actually really exciting. I have an opportunity to go to Kenya on a doTERRA co-impact sourcing trip in November. So I am sure I will come back with a lot of education and, and a new understanding for co-impact sourcing and working with the people. Kenya is where ginger and geranium and pink pepper are sourced from. So that's going to be a really, really powerful, powerful tool to have in there as well. Yay, I'm so glad that you guys are finding this information helpful. Yeah, with painful intercourse, it is a journey. So I went through a, a long journey with painful intercourse, and I think that requires changing your diet. For me, it did, going gluten, dairy, and sugar-free, working with a pelvic floor PT that was very skilled in that area, using the oils, use that aches and discomfort blend, lavender and geranium, try that as well. 
Um, also dive deeper into the emotional aspects that are going on around that too. And for me, the pelvic floor PT was a godsend. We did dry needling. We did a lot of different things. Pelvic pain is a journey. It's a marathon, not a sprint. It's something that I've been working on, but healing is possible. I'm here to tell you that I'm living proof of that. So yeah. Yay. I'm so glad that you guys love the recipes and, and all of this information. Oh, I'm so glad. Yes. Yes, if you're, if you're dealing with leakage with the sneezing, try the neck. Try tightening up, right, and tightening that transverse abdominis and pelvic floor and like cough or sneeze. And the more that you practice that, when it comes on, it'll be automatic and it'll make such a difference. And, and take a look at those bladder irritants and things as well. Yeah, so postmenopause, that could be a hormonal issue. That could be vaginal dryness. Um, Again, I, I look at the dietary things with that, looking at the things holistically, looking at using the oils for hormonal support with that. Maybe worth going and seeing a functional medicine doctor and actually getting hormones tested and seeing exactly where you are. Maybe it's a situation where bioidentical hormones are needed. Um, using uh, lubrication, and um, I would use a, a clean lubrication, right? One without propylene glycol or things in there. Um, slippery stuff seems to be pretty good. There's a brand called Sustain that's pretty good. Silk is another one that has um, some cleaner personal lubricants that you can use on that that can really help. Oh, thanks, Ileana. Yeah, that's great advice. Definitely. Okay, well, thanks for joining me. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your Friday. Yeah, Jan. Okay, that breaks my heart. So we got, we got to talk to this. She said, went to a doctor regard, regarding intercourse pain and he made her feel so uncomfortable. She never went back. This is where it's time to find a new doctor, right? This is time to find somebody that you trust, that you can have these open, honest conversations with and keep looking. I saw so many doctors for the pelvic pain. I was told that the pain was all in my head, that um, just, just drink a glass of wine, just take a bath, you just need to relax, all of these things. And it's very condescending and frustrating to be told something like that. So I would say don't give up on your journey. When people are telling you those things, they're letting you know that they're not the right person to help you. Go around, like keep looking. This is not the person that's gonna help and serve us. So I would really encourage you to continue to find somebody who is specialized in that area, find a pelvic floor PT in that area, do your own research. But again, healing is possible. I struggled with pelvic pain for over 10 years. I wasn't able to have intercourse, any of that. And I'm now just getting to a place where I can, and it's been really freeing. Um, again, looking into that book, uh, Pussy has been a game changer for me for redefining how I look at myself and my body and even just womanhood and the feminine in general with that is really, really powerful. So do not give up. You keep looking for somebody. There are a lot of people out there that can help us and support us and we hold space for them. So don't give up on your journey. If I told you how many doctors, uh, tons of doctors, hundreds of doctors, probably that I've seen, but it just takes, you know, finding that right one and also an integrative approach with that, you know, looking at diet, diet, lifestyle, stress, sleep, nutrition, movement, finding joy and fun in life. All of these things are so, so important to our health and our wellness. Yay. Yes. Add in the enzymes and the probiotics, Carrie, that will be such, such a huge one. I'm so glad that you guys are liking the information. Thanks. I'm so glad you like the diffuser. This, I actually don't know where it's from. It was a gift from one of my beautiful Crossline sisters when I had reached um, a, a celebratory goal in my business. And she, it even has my name on it. It's really cool. So it was a gift. Thanks. I'm glad that you like the diffuser. You know, to be honest, I don't really know a lot about the Mona Lisa technique. I haven't personally researched it or done it. I have heard from other women that it was really helpful for them, something to look into. I personally probably would go more the avenue of nutritional changes, lifestyle changes, dietary changes, working with a good pelvic floor PT, working with a good functional medicine doctor, those integrative approaches, because I truly believe healing comes from the inside out and giving the body the right foundations and support and tools to do those things. But it's definitely a possibility. And I always say, you know, tune into your own research, tune into your own intuition, your own inner wisdom and see what resonates and works best for you. But honestly, when we get really quiet, we usually know what the next right step is. 
for whatever that is. Um, in the book, Pussy by Mama Gina, she actually talks about like tuning in and asking yourself, asking her that part of your body, what do you think we should do? And I thought that was interesting. Um, so again, like being open to things, getting quiet, but if you don't have peace about something, that's the biggest thing. If you don't have peace about something, don't do it. It's going to be very important there. But yeah, check out that book if you, if you dare. It blew my mind. Lots of really, really good information there. And I know that that's a word that is triggering for a lot of people. And even for myself, I was like, oh, oh, I don't know if I can read a book like that. But it has been an absolute game changer in so many things. Yeah, functional medicine doctors are everywhere, more and more places. If I can tell you, if I'm in a little West Texas town and can find one, you guys can totally find one. So um, get gritty, do your research, get online, ask friends, look on Yelp. But there's a lot of integrative doctors. Some of them you may have to travel to. I did that for a while. Uh, it's an investment in your health and wellness. Most of them do not take insurance and are usually cash pay, but they do take an integrative holistic approach and it can change everything for you. So yeah, I'd really, really encourage you to, to do that and have that on hand. You have the book? Yes, Carolyn. <laughs> I love it. Yes, yes, yes. You know, and I think it's getting rid of the taboo, right? Why do we have to cover that up? Maybe another woman sees you read that and is encouraged and you change your life. As we start talking about this, to be honest, it was something that I was even like afraid to talk to you guys about. But as we're having this conversation, it's healing and more and more people are, are seeing that. And let's, let's bring it to the surface. Let's have the big discussions, right? Let's talk about the pelvic floor and leakage and, and incontinence and all of these things. And this is how we change the world, right? Talking about things that most people don't want to talk about. It's how we heal. It's how we heal together, right? We learn and then we share. We pass that on to other people. Okay, you guys have a wonderful rest of your Friday. Thank you for being here. The replay will be up until August 31st. So you can catch that throughout the rest of the month. You can take notes. And if you start to implement some of these things, please share please tag me on social media, share with a girlfriend or somebody there. I love to see what you're doing with this information, how these classes are helping you. I will see you next month for another health and wellness class. Thank you for joining or watching the replay. I'm sending you all each lots of love and light. Don't forget to enter into our giveaway to get your happy roller, right? Connecting with that emotional support and the feminine. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for being here, everybody. Bye.